postponed, hoping to be able to welcome you all here physically and have different problems than we had last year with hybrid. So we'll be happy to, to worry about if there is enough hot coffee or vegetarian food or stuff like that. So it's really great to have this event today here starting. And we're just not gonna keep you too long. We want to start as soon as possible with our technical program, but let's just give you some uh, kind of logistic details and uh, uh, some heads, heads up to see what's, what's ahead. So this is officially the first ICR hybrid conference. So we were also the first online conference. So we have many firsts of Stepan and me, so that's also great. And you see some numbers here, but we're gonna update those still because people are still registering, especially online. So that's easy, uh, but yeah, at the moment we have close to 260 people physically here in Zagreb, uh, out of which more than half are students, which is another, I think, uh, major change for ISCR events, because like, yeah, students seem, seem to be more happy to, to go back to traveling and it's kind of sort of normal life. Uh, at the moment, when I checked this morning, uh, was 425 or so online. It could be more already now, and it will, this this uh, number will for sure increase. But yeah, uh, that's definitely gonna beat the physical attendance. But that's fine. I guess we are still happy. Um, yeah, there are quite some new ICR members out of those. So let's see how uh, that also changes. So we're gonna update you in the RAM session talk on the numbers. Okay. Okay, so this is the schedule. The conference program is running from Monday to Thursday. Um, so we'll have lunches and coffee breaks in the hall, um, except the online people, of course. Um, RAM session is tomorrow evening and uh, all the details are available online. So check the website. You still have time to submit both here and online. So that's, that's great. Um, I hope you keep uh, Peter and Andy busy with your submissions. Um, and then as usual, like in all times, we have banquet on Wednesday from 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, Stepan will show the event in a bit and buses will leave from in front of the hotel at 6.30. Uh, started leaving and then there are five buses. So make sure that you are not too late. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, important part are some rules, some Corona rules. So I will hand over to Stepan for that. Thank you. So yes, uh, please wear your badges all the time. It's because of Corona rules, we kind of need to know how many people actually do we have in room and are all those people registered. Uh, have your vac uh, COVID vaccination or test proof also with you. So we do not expect controls, but we could get a control. And wear your mask except when seated and during meals. So now you are not obliged to wear a mask. If you want to wear it, yeah, feel free. That's fine. It's fine, of course. Um, if you have any questions, you will see many, many students with um, pink shirts, t-shirts, with uh, writing, ask me anything, like the lady here. So you can use opportunity and ask anything. Uh, of course, there is also registration desk at the main entrance. So please register there if you did not. There are also city maps there and things like that. Social program. So what do we have for you? There will be city tours every day in the afternoon. Sign up at the registration desk. There is limited number of places uh, for every uh, tour. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday tours. Monday, Thursday, starting 5.15, so after the program, and two hours. Tomorrow, Wednesday, starting at 4, so that you finish before ramp session, before banquet, and lasting 90 minutes. Uh, all the tours will start at the Westin entrance and finish somewhere close to Westin. For Banquet, uh, buses will be picking up and bringing you back. So you can see here the, the room for, well, the, the uh, hall for the Banquet. And you can see a small, uh, it's called Lauba. Yes, if you want to Google it, uh, you can also see a picture of the interior, the decoration although this was for wedding, so we do not get exact, exactly the same one. But we get close. We get close, of course. And do not worry, so the, uh, the hall is huge. It's 1,200 uh, square meters, so it's more than all of us by all the corona rules and then some. That being said, uh, 
back to Leila. Yes, so just last, same as last year, we, we kept all the sponsors, so the sponsorship just rolled over to this edition, and we're again happy to thank you for so then their long-term support. Uh, in particular, TII, Technology Innovation Institute, as our platinum sponsor, then our golden sponsors, Calibra, Visa, and Google. And then some more silver and uh, bronze. So Hardware IO, Crypto Experts, IBM Research, Rambus, PQ Shield, Cloudflare, Platon, SEA, and Intrinsic ID. Of course, also many thanks to EACR Corona Committee, Program Chairs, Ankanto and FX Standard, uh, local support, Marin Golub, Domago Jakobovic, Kay McKelly and Kevin McCurley. Of course, thank you very much for a lot of things done. Uh, Peter Schwabe for Affiliated Events Chair, and of course, Radbau team, many, many students and professors. So Simona, Web Chair, Marluz, Stipend Lyason, then Charlotte, Constantina, Krein, Lukas, Monica, Parisa in the shirts, and then Irma and Shanley, visa letters, more. And yeah, thank you all. That being said, thank you all in the audience and also you virtually present for coming or attending. Follow us on Twitter and yeah, enjoy the conference. So we're going to start with our first technical session, which is the uh, best paper award, including. And session chair is Christian Kashan. Long time no see. Thank you. Well, long time no see for everyone here. Now we see. OK. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Um, especially also half of the attendees definitely in the room. Um, feels great, but also special to be here. Um, also knowing that um, in my previous role as the, as the ISER uh, president, I was talking to Leila and Stepan years ago already about this conference. And so I'm really glad to finally uh, see it happen and see it starting in uh, Zagreb. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I see Kevin here. Now we had a busy weekend, especially Kevin, because... Um, the ISR server's power supply uh, died, and that's why some of the websites were not available over the weekend. But now I think much of it is restored, but not everything yet. Anyway, um, let's go over to um, the technical program then. This is a special session, I understand, because um, it will have longer talks than the others. It's the best papers, uh, or the best paper awards session. And so I would welcome the first uh, speaker uh, presenting the first paper, Non-Interactive Zero Knowledge from Sub-Exponential DDH uh, by Abhishek Jain and Sengjong Jin. Um, Sengjong, where in the world are you? Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, it works perfectly. Yes, over to you. I'm going to withdraw to the side and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So this work is about uh, non-interactive general knowledge from sub-exponential DDH. I'm Zheng Zhongjing from Johns Hopkins University, and this work is joined with Abhishek Jen. So non-interactive general knowledge protocol is a two-party protocol between a prover and a verifier in the CRS model. So the prover tries to convince the verifier that some instance X is in some NP language L by sending a single round of message to the verifier. Then the verifier can decide to accept or reject the proof. We require the following properties of the non-interactive zero knowledge protocol. For completeness, we request that for any instance X that is in this language L, the verifier should always accept the only study generated proof. Well, for the soundness, we request that for any instance X that is not in this language L, the verifier should always reject the cheating proof. And finally, for the zero knowledge property, we request that the proof should not reveal nothing else beyond the fact that X is in this language L. So under what assumptions can we contract these X? On the private works, we know how to contract these X from a batch of uh, assumptions 
such as quadratic residuosity, factoring by linear maps, and uh, recently by the work of uh, Kennedy at all, and also by Parkin and Shishan, they construct physics from learning with arrows. And also by recent beautiful work by Brodsky at all, they construct the physics from learning parity with noise and the trapdoor hash functions. Well, the trapdoor hash function are known from most of the standard assumptions, such as DDH learning with arrow, quadratic residuosity, and DCR, etc. As you can see from this list, it seems that we know how to construct physics from most of the standard assumptions that implies public key encryption. And a notable exception from this list is the assumptions related to the discrete logarithm. So in this work, we study the following question. Do there exist physics from DDH? Answering this question can also help us understand the gap between pairing and the non-pairing groups. For example, for those cryptographic primitives that we know how to build them from pairing groups, can we also build them from non-pairing groups? For example, in the setting of attribute-based encryption, where we know how to build the ABE from pairing groups, we don't know how to build them from non-pairing groups. Well, in the context of identity-based encryption, such gap was closed by the work of Dotting and Garks. In this work, however, our focus is on the setting of physics, where we know how to build physics from pairing groups. But so far, we don't know how to build them from non-pairing groups. So in this work, we seek to understand uh, whether such gaps are inherent. Note that if you allow non-standard assumptions, then we do know how to construct physics from non-pairing groups. So here is our first result. We construct music arguments for a general MP language. We have two constructions with different zero knowledge property and soundness properties. And both of our constructions are in the common random CRS model. Both of them are based on the sub-exponential DDH assumption in the standard non-pairing groups. The DDH, the sub-exponential DDH assumption in this work is as follows. We assume that for any probabilistic polynomial time adversary, the, uh, the, it is hard uh, for it to distinguish the DDH tuple and the, the random tuple by more than sub-exponential amount. In this work, we also constructed statistical zap arguments for sub-exponential DDH assumption with non-adaptive soundness. So the statistical ZAP arguments are the two-round public coin witness indistinguishable protocol with statistical witness indistinguishability. So why this result is interesting is because previously we only know we don't know any statistical ZAP arguments from group-based assumptions. So this is the case. If you, even if you assume bilinear maps. So in the, uh, in the rest of the talk, uh, so in this talk, I will mainly focus on our first result. And if you are interested in our second result, you can refer to our paper for more details. So central to our method is the Fender-Shamir paradigm. So next, let me recall the Fender-Shamir transformation. The find the Shamir transformation allows you to collapse a public coin interactive protocol into a non-interactive one by replacing all the wire virus message with the hash of the transcript so far. And the soundness of the resulting non-interactive protocol was firstly proven sound in the random Markov model. Later, by a long line of research initiated by Kennedy et al started to instantiate this hash function in the standard model. And the high level intuition to construct such hash function is as follows. We want to build such a hash function H such that the input and output and the output pair of uh, this hash function don't satisfy any bad correlations. So the work by Kennedy et al 
formalize this intuition as the correlation in charge of hash function. Such a hash function is in fact an ensemble of hashes that is indexed by some key k, where this key k is some binary string of polynomial length. And uh, in this talk, I will use the correlation in charge of hash function uh, for functions. So we say a uh, hash function is correlation intractable for a function class F. If for any function in this function class, for any efficient adversary, if we give it this adversary a uh, key k sampled by the key gen algorithm, then it is hard for it to find some input x such that the hash of x equals to f of x. Such a notion of a correlation in charitable hash function is very useful and is very important. It has found many applications recently, such as NISIX, SNARKs, rifle delay functions, and the PPAT hardness, etc. But for now, let's assume we already have such a correlation in charitable hash function. How do we prove the soundness of the resulting non interactive protocol after the finish transformation? So the idea is we start with some sigma protocol and I recall that the sigma protocol satisfied the following special soundness property, which says that if you have two accepting transcript who share the first the same, uh, who share the same first message alpha and with different second message beta, then you can extract a witness from these two accepting transcripts. Then this implies that for any cheating prover who tries to cheat for some instance X that is not in this language L, for any uh, first message alpha, there exists a unique beta that can make this transcript be accepted. This is because otherwise, if there exists two such beta, then you can use the special soundness to extract a witness for this X. But this contradicts to the fact that X is not in L then this implies that we can define a bad function which maps any alpha to the unique beta that makes this transcript be accepted. Now, given this bad function, how do we prove the soundness of the resulting non-interactive protocol after the faint Shamir transformation? So let's consider a cheating prover who tries to cheat for some X that is not in L and the cheating proof is the alpha, beta, gamma. So we will prove by the contradiction. So let's say this cheating proof is accepted. Then this implies that this second message beta, it must be equal to the bad of alpha by the definition of this bad function. But at the same time, by the fan shamer transformation, this beta also equals to the hash of alpha. And this contradiction to the correlation in charitable, this and this is a contradiction to the uh, correlation in tractability because the cheating prover find this alpha uh, where the hash of alpha equals to the bad of alpha. And in this way, we prove the soundness. So do we know how to construct such a correlation in charitable hash function? So previously, uh, by the work of Piker and, and uh, Sichan, which is based on the work of Ken Tiato, they contracted the correlation trouble hash function from learning with arrows for polynomial size bounded circuit. And later, by the work of Braxky et al., they constructed the correlation trouble hash function for approximable constant degree polynomials. And their construction is generic from any trapdoor hash function for constant degree polynomial, where the trapdoor hash function is known for most of the standard assumptions. In their work, by further assuming the learning parity with noise assumption, they built NISICs from LPN and the trapdoor hash function. However, in this work, we cannot hope to use the LPN assumption since our goal is to construct NISICs from DDH. But for the DDH-based Sigma protocol, the bad function is not known 
to be approximable by constant degree polynomials. Then can we build correlation interval hash function for a larger circuit class from DDH assumption? Well, if we want to follow the method by the work of Braxky at all, then uh, we need to build a, a travel hash function for a larger circuit class that is more than constant degree polynomial. But uh, we also don't know how to build such travel hash function. In this work, we overcome this challenge and uh, constructed the first correlation tractable hash function for TC0 circuit from some exponential DDH assumption. And here, the TC0 circuit consists of the uh, uh, constant depth threshold circuits. So to uh, achieve our results on the NISX and the correlation interval hash function, what is our approach? Firstly, um, we observe that the correlation interval hash function for TC0 circuit is sufficient to construct NISX from DDH. And uh, secondly, uh, sorry. And uh, secondly, uh, <coughs> we construct such correlation interval hash function for TC0 circuit. By extending the travel door hash functions to interactive travel door hash function to handle the TC0 circuit. Then we apply a generic round collapsing technique to collapse the interactive travel door hashing protocol and uh, build a uh, a uh, correlation interval hash function for TC0. In the rest of the talk, I will mainly focus on the construction of this uh, correlation interval hash function for TC0. As I just said, our main tool is the following uh, interactive travel door hashing protocol. So such a protocol is a two-party protocol between a sender and a receiver. On the sender side, it has some input x, and on the receiver side, it has a multi-bit output function f. And the goal is to have both parties interact in multiple rounds, such that in the end of the protocol, they both obtain some vectors e and d. And we denote this vector E and D as encodings and decodings. And we require that if you XOR this encoding with the decoding, you will obtain the output of the function f of x. And we call this property as an additive reconstruction property. Moreover, on the sender side, we require the communication complexity to be laconic, which means we require the sender's message size to be bounded by the security parameter. And most importantly, we want the sender's message size to be independent of the input and output length of this function f. Uh, on the other hand, for the receiver side, we require uh, the receiver's message to hide the description of this function f. And we call this property as the function hiding property. So this is the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol. And now you may wonder why we call this notion as the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol. So in fact, we observe that the previous work of trapdoor hashing function by Dotting et al. can imply a two-round interactive trapdoor hashing protocol. So we regard our notion as a generalization of the travel door hash function from two rounds to multiple rounds. Next, I'm going to show you more technical details on how we collapse this interactive travel door hashing protocol and build the correlation in travel hash function. Let me first describe the key generation algorithm for this hash function. So our initial idea 
you still take any interactive trapdoor hashing protocol and then remove all the sender's messages. Then we gather these uh, receiver's messages together and uh, concatenate it with some uniform random mask U. And we set this whole thing at the CI hash key, K. However, we cannot hope to do this in the key generation because the receivers, for, uh, because for each round of the receiver's message, may depends on the sender's message in the previous round. And now, since we remove the sender's messages, how can we have the receiver generate this receiver's message? So the idea is we have the receiver guess the sender's messages uniformly at random. And we use these guess the messages to generate the receiver's messages. Now this is the key generation algorithm. So given a say a hash key K, how do we compute uh, the hash of X for any X? So the idea is we have the uh, hash algorithm to play the role as the sender of the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol. And we use the receiver's message specified in the CI hash key. So the hash algorithm does everything the sender needs to do. And finally, obtain some encoding E. Then we set the hash of X as the encoding XOR with the uniform random mask U specified in the CI hash key. So next, I'm going to show you how to prove the correlation intractability of this uh, construction. But before that, let me recall what is the correlation intractability. So we say uh, this hash function is correlation intractable for this uh, function class F. If for any F in this function class, it is hard for this adversary to find some input X where the hash of X equals to F of X. And in our case, this hash key consists of a uniform random mask U and all the receiver's messages in the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol. So to prove the correlation so to prove the correlation intractability, let me start with some simpler case where the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol only have two rounds. And in fact, in this case, the proof follows directly uh, from the previous work by Braxky, Copria, and Moore. So the idea is they started with some with the uh, additive reconstruction property, which states that this uh, output of the uh, function f f of x it equals to the XOR of the encoding and the decoding. And then uh, we will prove the correlation intractability by contradiction. So suppose there is some efficient adversary who can find the, an input x such that the hash of x equals to f of x. Then this implies that the right hand side is also equal. So the mask u equals to this decoding d. Uh, but this is unlikely to happen because this decoding d is sparse in its range since it only depends on the sender's message. But the sender's message is uh, very small. So if we set the uh, output length of this hash function to be large enough, then we can argue that if we sample this u from its range, then only with a negligible probability, this u can hit any of the possible values of this decoding. So in this way, uh, we argue that the adversary is successful, the success probability of this adversary is only negligible. So we prove the correlation intractability. However, this proof only works for two rounds and it's not clear how to generalize this method to multiple rounds. This is because when the number of rounds is more than two, then we have the receiver guess the sender's message. And this guessing is only correct with some negligible probability. So the correctness of this protocol is no longer guaranteed. In this work, uh, we observe that, in fact, to prove the correlation intractability, we don't need the, uh, the fully correctness of this uh, interactive protocol. Instead, 
we only need the we only need the correctness to hold with some make uh, some sub exponential probability, but we still want to lower bound this uh, uh, guessing correctness. So the way we uh, lower bound the guessing correctness is as follows: we observe that indeed we can take different security parameters for different runs in this protocol. So we simply uh, choosing an uh, increasing sequence of security parameters for each round. And then by relying on the sub-exponential DDH assumption, we are able to argue that the guessing probability is, uh, the guessing correctness is uh, with sub-exponential probability. Then we argue that this uh, uh, sub-exponential guessing correctness is large enough to argue the correlation intractability. Like two or three minutes left, yep. moderator uh, here. Yeah, thanks. So uh, finally, let me show you some very high level uh, idea on how to build this interactive trapdoor hash function. So the idea is we take any circuit in TC0 and convert it into a layered circuit. Then we construct interactive trapdoor hash function for this circuit, uh, for each layer of this circuit. And then we compose this interactive trapdoor hash protocols sequentially to obtain the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol for the entire circuit. In more detail, for uh, to construct the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol for a single layer of threshold gate, we decompose the threshold gate computation to two linear functions. And then we use trapdoor hash function to compute each linear function. And then we compose these two trapdoor hash functions sequentially to obtain the interactive trapdoor hashing protocol for a single threshold gate. So the same idea can be extended from a single threshold gate to a layer of threshold gates. So this concludes our construction for the interactive uh, trapdoor hashing protocol. So finally, uh, this is a summary of our result. We constructed the first NISX from sub-exponential DDH. And uh, to obtain our result, we constructed a correlation trouble hash function for TC0 from a sub-exponential DDH. And we also constructed statistical type arguments from sub-exponential DDH. Uh, some open questions for future detection. So can we construct NISX from polynomial time hardness of DDH? And uh, can we contract NISX from public key encryption? So this problem is also related to, uh, can we contract correlation trouble hash function uh, from public key encryption? And finally, can we construct correlation intractable hash function for a larger circuit class from DDH? So if we can achieve this, then we can also obtain the same applications of a correlation intractable hash functions in the recent works from DDH assumption. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for a question from the room or from remote. I don't hear any. So maybe in the interest of time, uh, we proceed directly to the next talk then. Thank you again. And uh, okay, I see the next uh, screen is being shared already. The next uh, talk is also remote. It's on the insecurity of ROS. And uh, I had to look it up, yeah. This is the random inhomogeneities in an overdetermined solvable system of linear equations, yeah. So uh, it's much more compact to pronounce this as ROS. Um, this talk, uh, this, this paper, this uh, work is by Fabrice Benamuda, Tanka Le Point, Julian Loss, Michele Oru, and Mariana Raikova. And Michele is going to give the talk. Michele, can you say something so that we see your picture here?
We don't hear you yet. Hello. Hello, the grab. Now it's good. Okay. The floor is I yours. I hear a lot please. of echo, though. Sorry? I hear a lot of echo. Can you mute yourself once you give the give me the, the word? Yes. Now, please, okay. uh, please go on. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, this talk is going to be about um, um, the crypt analysis of uh, ROS. ROS is a cryptographic assumption that was first introduced by Schnorr uh, 20 years ago. It pops up when you try to prove uh, Schnorr blind signatures. And um, incidentally, um, finding a solution uh, to this problem led to concrete attacks to a bunch of other construction that have been uh, sort of developed in the meantime. Um, these are, for instance, some blind signatures such as blind Schnorr, Okamoto Schnorr, when you allow for parallel executions, as we will see later, um, multi-signatures, um, such as uh, um, <laughs> um, um, such as the Turan version of Musig, um, threshold signatures, such as the initial version of Frost and uh, JJKR, um, eCache systems, such as brand signatures, and uh, anonymous credentials, such as anonymous credentials like, and you prove from Microsoft. Um, these are all in the specific setting of uh, parallel executions. And in some of these protocols, it will, uh, we will also require um, some uh, additional settings that will make the security of this scheme hinge uh, and rely on ROS. Okay, so first of all, what is ROS? Um, yeah, it means uh, random inhomogeneities in an overdetermined solvable system of linear equations. It is um, more simply, um, we fix a prime P, uh, we fix a number L, and uh, then we ask the adversary to produce L plus one vectors that I'm indicating here with rho, such that the inner product of rho with these uh, coefficients will uh, end up in the, um, in the hash image. The image of what? Of the vector itself. Okay. Now, um, let me try to visualize it for you. Um, again, whoops. Uh, the adversary has to find um, these matrix that has L plus one rows and L columns, such that the matrix times this vector will end up in the hash image of each row. Now, um, to get our grips with this problem, uh, there are some uh, easy way of uh, thinking about it. For instance, if we fix the matrix to be the identity matrix on the top, so because we have, so I didn't say anything about the last row for now, um, then it is very easy to find the, um, the vector C that satisfies the equation, right? I can just select the, at the i-th position, the hash, the hash of the i-th row, and I know that uh, it's the only term that's gonna be uh, surviving the inner product. So um, I, will, uh, I will end up with, with this sort of partial solution. So really the, the hardness of this problem is about finding a non-trivial linear combination of uh, hash images that will still land in a valid hash image. Okay. Um, also, there is nothing special about choosing identity metrics. I could, uh, for instance, just as well, have we cut another, another metrics, multiply it by two and sort of corrected uh, this, uh, this factor in, uh, in the vector C. And again, the problem is, uh, is to find this non-trivial solution. Um, the best attack known so far uh, for these uh, sort of problems uh, was uh, the generalized Berthe attack from Wagner. Um, essentially, this uh, um, attack consisted in creating a bunch of lists with uh, hash images, and then finding elements in these lists that XOR uh, into zero. With a small leap of faith, we can also do, uh, believe that the attack will uh, sum modulo p to zero. And um, this is called the generalized Berthe attack because if I fix L to be equal to one, I'm essentially trying to find uh, true hash images that are equal. Um, and uh, more in general, this uh, attack runs in times that is sub-exponential that depends on the prime p and the number of open sessions. And uh, we can use this algorithm here because um, essentially we can fix the last row to be all equal to one. 
And then we try to find uh, valid elements. I said that there are L solutions that are easy to find. Uh, we will try to find those solutions, those uh, sort of partial solutions that when I do the inner product, they add up to this specific value, the hash of one. Right, but um, as you can see, there is a, there is much more flexibility than this, right? I can choose uh, not only one, I can, I can choose a subset of them. And this would be more similar to a subset sum problem that we know is, is hard in general, or uh, I can put any linear combination. And uh, this is specifically what we did. And um, so our contribution was uh, finding a polynomial, time, a polynomial time attacker that uh, um, actually unexpected polynomial time attacker that uh, will produce a valid ROS solution. Um, so again, what, uh, what are we trying to find? The computationally hard problem is uh, finding these vectors L plus one vectors, um, such that the inner product with these coefficients will be in the image of the hash function. We said that there are L solutions that are easy. I just pick the sort of a diagonal matrix and, uh, and it's done. Uh, the really hard part is find these, um, uh, this last row. And um, in fact, the, the idea for, uh, for uh, our, our attack is that we will try to set the coefficients such that when we multiply them with the respective uh, element C over the column vector, we will end up with either um, a zero or a power of two. And we know that uh, the subset sum problem is very easy when we are dealing with powers of two. More specifically, um, pick two valid um, tri sort of trivial partial solutions like uh, as I mentioned before, for instance, we could pick the diagonal, the identity matrix or uh, another diagonal matrix. And let's define the following polynomial. Um, this is a polynomial F, J. So I'm going, to, I'm going to define one for each of the rows of these uh, sort of diagonal matrix that uh, is defined by interpolation and it will be equal to zero when evaluated on the first set and um, to two to the J when evaluated on the second one. Now, this, uh, this polynomial is, uh, <laughs> is pretty easy to find. It's, um, it's a polynomial of degree one. Um, all of these terms, they are essentially constants that they can uh, be compute. And uh, I'm going calling them C for a reason. And, um, and then I'm going to define this other polynomial. I'm just going to sum over all the Fs and um, I'm calling this polynomial row. Again, this, is, uh, this notation is not by, by chance. Um, that uh, is, uh, again, a polynomial of degree one um, with, a, with a constant term that I'm calling row L. And uh, this polynomial has a special property. For uh, some relatively large L, I can take any element in my field and um, I can write it in binary. Right, uh, using L elements. And um, I note that uh, each term over here is um, either zero or two to the J, right? So uh, by definition of FJ, it's just an evaluation of F either on the first set of solution or on the second. But this is the sum of all the FJs. So it's uh, an evaluation of row over um, sort of different uh, elements that again are selected either to be the hash of uh, the row with one or with the row with two, for instance. So again, the, particular, the, the peculiarity of this polynomial is that I can express any element in my field as an evaluation of this polynomial on, uh, on some points that are selected depending on the binary decomposition of the number itself. If this is true for any element in the field, then it is true also for uh, this particular element in the field. I'm going to compute, I have my polynomial, I hash its coefficient and then I shift it by the constant term. And in particular for this N, if I plug it in here, I will see that the constant term cancels out in both sides. And uh, I will end up with, um, um, with a linear combination of the row J's with some C's. But, uh, 
this is uh, one of the inner products that I was looking for, right? And uh, it's in particular a non-trivial one. So essentially we, we are done. And um, yeah, this is the attack. Um, again, wrapping up, <laughs> the, the, um, the attack works as follows. Um, I pick two valid partial solutions, uh, sort of, for instance, the identity metrics and the metrics with uh, uh, choose. Then I, I compute their hash. Now I need their hash to be different, right? In order to, to do a successful uh, interpolation of that, that gives me a degree one. Um, and this is essentially the only reason why our algorithm is expected polynomial time, as I said before, um, but we can expect that uh, this happens very rarely. Um, then I will construct the, the little polynomials fj, add them up, essentially computing this polynomial row that has the properties that we just saw. Um, finally, we decompose in, uh, in binary this element, uh, interpret as an element in the field, and that's it. We have a non-trivial solution, which is just given by the coefficients of the polynomial that we found. And uh, we have, and we have uh, um, sort of easy solutions that are just select, just uh, used by selecting um, the rows that we had at the beginning, uh, depending on the bit of the binary decomposition of this guy. Yeah, that's it. Um, now, the, um, uh, before, sort of mentioning the like the properties of rho, I said that uh, it happens for relatively large L. Um, in particular, L must be at least log P because I must express this element over here, um, which is random um, in, uh, in binary. And I need enough elements in order to do that. So um, we had another idea and we extend it in the paper that essentially merges the attack of Wagner with our attack. Um, essentially in the following way. Um, we use Wagner uh, not to find a set of elements that adds up to zero, but was most significant digits add up to zero. Once we set the most significant digits to zero, then we can run our algorithm knowing that the binary decomposition will have little zeros at the end. So um, we still end up with a sub-exponential attack, but the complexity of the attack drops much faster than with Wagner, that here you can see sort of in the, in the white line, uh, whereas our attack is sort of displayed here in a, in a rainbow. <laughs> um, actually, the colors have a, have a natural meaning. Uh, they sort of identify um, the drop of number of lists that you need in order to run Wagner. So it's also, as you can see, sort of drops the more L increases. Okay, so now before um, going through the uh, into Wonderland and showing you like uh, how deep the rabbit hole goes, um, like is there any question up to here? Uh, I'm sorry, I was muted here, <laughs> but the room, there was no, no question so far. Huh? Otherwise, you let me know. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, also, if you didn't understand anything, this section is uh, pretty much self-contained. So, you know, it could be, um, yeah. So blend signatures, uh, what are they? Um, they are uh, a protocol between a user and a server. The user has a message. Uh, the, the, the server has a, a signing key. The user wants to compute a signature on the message without uh, revealing any information about the message and the server um, without revealing the signing key. So we have two notions of security here. We have unforgeability, which essentially says that any user, even after interacting multiple times with the server will not be able to produce most, more signatures than actually allowed. As you can see here, we have an L and uh, this L is exactly the L that we will find in our OS. And we have blindness. Um, blindness essentially protects the user and says that no information about the message is ever revealed at, during the signing phase, during the issuance phase. But again, as we are providing an attack against uh, um, unforgeability, we were not covering, I'm not going to cover this. And uh, perhaps, one, uh, one of the most popular blind signatures are Schnellberg. 
Schnorr blind signatures. And um, uh, their protocol is a bit overwhelming. Uh, and again, like we don't really care about the users. So let me simplify it a bit for you. Um, so uh, it's not blind, but it's a uh, Schnorr blind signature essentially work uh, very much like uh, Schnorr identification protocol. So the signer will send a commitment. The user will compute a challenge that uh, is of the form random oracle evaluation over the commitment and the message. And then the server will compute a response that is generated as the combination of the challenge and the, and the commitment. Um, the resulting protocol at, at the end of the resulting signature will verify the so-called verification equation, which is essentially um, checking the computation of the response, but in the group, and then checking that the challenge was correctly computed from the random oracle. Now, um, because this protocol has true messages from the server, when we study the security, um, we cannot just uh, um, have one single oracle for signing queries, right? Because the adversary might start multiple sessions at the same time and then stop and then decide a challenge after seeing multiple commitments. For this reason, when we study the security, we have to consider to really keep track of the open sessions, which one has been closed and so on. And as we will see, this, in, this, uh, this possibility of opening parallel sessions is really what uh, allows for our attack kicking. So in order to attack Schnorr, what would I do? I would open L sessions, so I would receive L commitments from the server. And at the end, I would have to produce L plus one forgeries. But for now, for now, the adversary doesn't do anything. It's going to stop and think. It is going to run the engine that I discussed uh, just before um, in order to find the ROS solution. What were the ROS solution? They were a bunch of vectors such that their linear combination with these coefficients will give me a hash image. Now, I don't have really have this hash function, do I? But instead, I'm going to forward each random oracle query to the linear combination of the elements in this vector with the commitments that are over here. And uh, the, this is the, the hash function for uh, that, I, that I'm provided when I run this protocol, I have a commitment and a message. The messages are all arbitrary. The adversary can choose whatever they want. Then the adversary is going, just to is going to reply with these coefficients that I obtained from running the, the attack. And, um, and I'm going to receive some responses. And then that's it, I'm done. I can provide L plus one forgeries and they are of the following form. I generate um, the i-th forgery, just as the linear combination of the rows from the ROS solution of the commitments that are given by the signer. Note that this guy over here is exactly what gets plugged in the hash function here. I'm going to do the same for the challenges and note that the challenge here is exactly what goes on the left-hand side here. And I'm going to do the, also the same for the response. Whoops. And uh, they are valid uh, signatures because by definition of uh, uh, the response uh, in here, I will have the DRG linear combination. Um, because Schnorr blind signatures are correct, they will satisfy the verification equation in this transcript themselves. And um, by distributivity of the multiplication, I can just replace them with a C star and K star. So we really have L plus one valid signatures from running this. Now, um, there are lots of protocols that follow the same template. Um, either you have additional conditions on the commitments, maybe you compute the hash function in another way. Um, maybe the you have multiple challenges that satisfy some common property, but the, the attack, works exactly in the same way. And uh, this is why, despite this template were used uh, all over, um, in the case of parallel sessions, there was, uh, there was sometimes also this problem. So after publishing the, the paper, some people were sort of uh, unsure whether the attack would be really practical. So we implemented it. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, creating L plus one forgeries on uh, modern security parameters um, 
in Sage is like 55 lines, even considering the code for the server. So um, yeah, it's definitely a practical attack. This runs in uh, like less than a couple seconds. And um, yeah, so I guess the moral of this talk is that uh, cryptography is difficult. And um, even if sometimes we have security proofs for uh, protocols in a sequential model, um, you know, on the internet, there are many things that happen in parallel. So um, um, a slight variation in the setting might be really dangerous for security. And more concretely, we do not think that uh, Schnorrblen signatures should be um, deployed in a setting where you can have uh, multiple signing issuances at the same time. And um, which is essentially the case of any TCP connection. Um, but um, yeah, there are still other blind signatures in the game. There is Blender SA that is sort of a, a vintage crypto system. Um, blind BLS, ABE blind signature, and closed Schnorr blind signatures that have been recently introduced by Fox Power and others. So yeah, this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Michele. Um, I suppose it's early morning or late night for you. Um, maybe there is uh, questions from the room. We do have time. So, so um, in your paper, I have a question here that came up for me because I'm looking into distributed crypto. Um, you also mentioned that uh, distributed key generation protocols and other discrete log based uh, schemes uh, protocols become uh, um, attackable through this. Can you elaborate on the, the type of attacks that this is? Is it, um, or how the possible defenses would be? Is there any way to defend the blind Schnorr signatures? Or is there? It depends on the setting, I think. Um, for instance, if you, yeah, it really depends on the setting where, where you're running this. Like the, the, trivia, the trivial way of avoiding this attack is to allow only for sequential queries. And there are settings where you can do this. For instance, if you're, uh, I don't know, you're connecting a, a USB device and you know that you are generating something only between the two of you. Um, but if you're talking to a server, then uh, um, either you expose yourself to a denial of service or you expose yourself to L plus one of eligibility. So, that's a, that's a difficult choice to make. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thanks. No other question from the room. Thank you again, Michele, and uh, all the authors of this paper as well. Congratulations. So then I think we will now come to the third and last, third and last uh, paper in this session. This will be this will be presented here in the room, I understand. Yes. So the title of the paper is um, New Representations of the AES uh, Key Schedule. It's by Gaetan Laurent and Clara Pernot. And Clara is going to give the talk. I think I'm going to leave the microphone right here for you. Um, I don't know yet how to bring up the slides here, but this will be, wait, did you press that before? Uh, yes, they are on the, they are already in on the desktop. On the desktop, yes. okay, okay. Let me see, the, or maybe we can just switch to, no, Zoom is Zoom. Desktop is yeah, yes. this Sarah. one? No, Sarah. Okay. And then we want to go here into presentation. Perhaps first uh, put a zoom in a zoom presentation. Action. How do we do that? We go back here. No. Go back to zoom. Here. No. Okay. How uh, maybe we have to go here, huh? Yes. Exit minimized. Okay. And now we we share. We share the screen. And now, do you know how to make this? It's okay, this must be Windows. So how do we get the full screen here? Control L does not work. <laughs> no. <laughs> full screen, how do you get full screen here? 
No? Here? Oh, yes, maybe. It used to be Control L, but yes. <laughs> it's not my computer, but let me Full try. screen. Maybe. No, no, no. <laughs> at least that. No, it's not. It's not what we want. We want yeah, full no, screen. We want full screen. I'm Real trying. full screen. <laughs> page view. Maybe go to page view and, and try that. No, <laughs> no, that's good. Now, still, okay. Yeah. Full screen. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is this Firefox. We just double clicked on it, okay? That's what we did. <laughs> we have here the okay, slides. Right click. right click and we open with... Try the two arrows pointing next to the left of page view. This one? Yeah, Adobe, great. Adobe, right. Because maybe it's going to install Adobe now. Who knows? Oh, no, we're good. Huh? This is a different thing? Yes. Right okay. Click. Here, no, no. If it's Adobe, it used to be Control L. You can try no. F11. <laughs> try F11. Control L. <laughs> okay. Can you see the slides in full? Okay. Looks like because no answer is good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Please go ahead. So, thanks for the introduction. My name is Lara Pernot, and I'm going to present a joint work with Gaëtan Laurent entitled New Representations of the AS Key Schedule. So uh, the AES is the most widely blocked cipher used today. It's used everywhere. And uh, the AES now designates the winner of the AES competition, which is a subset of the Rhinel block cipher, which was designed by Ryman and Damon. Uh, the AES works as follows. Well. So starting from a plain text of 128 bits, uh, we alternate a XOR with a round key and a round function. Here, I do not describe the round function because it's not the topic of this talk. And at the end, we obtain a cipher text. Uh, we have three versions of the AES corresponding to three uh, key sizes, 128, 192, or 256 bits. And here I will focus on the 128-bit version. So after 20 years of cryptanalysis, we have a strong confidence in the uh, AES secu security because only seven rounds out, out of 10 are broken and the progress are quite slow. Uh, but uh, concerning the key schedule, which is the part in, at the right uh, in this figure, uh, we know that it's known to cause issues in the related key settings. There are also some uh, unexpected properties that have already been demonstrated, like the key bridging property. So in, the, in this talk, we will focus on the key schedule. So the key schedule is the algorithm that allows to compute the 11 subkeys K0 to K10 from the master key. So it's in an iterative algorithm. Uh, so this algorithm works as follows. So starting from a subkey, uh, Sorry, we have to briefly interrupt you here because apparently the slides are not moving. We are not seeing the chat, by the way. Okay, <laughs> but ah, yes, but we are sure. sharing we are sharing the wrong thing. Okay, we are not sharing the desktop. Always share your desktop, even though it might be embarrassing. Um, so where or the, is our share, share button? Okay, because then we know at least what we are sharing. Okay, so now you should see the real slide at slide three. Huh? Yes. So uh, the AS uh, works as follows. So uh, at the top, we have a subkey, uh, which is here denoted K0 to K15. And then uh, to compute the next subkey, which is denoted K prime 0 to K prime 15, we apply this algorithm. So first, there are four S boxes uh, that correspond to the non-linear parts. And they are the same S boxes as the, as the one in the round function. Then there is also a XOR with a round constant and a Festel network structure. So looking at this figure, the impression is that all the bytes are mixed. Uh, and if we iterate several times this algorithm, we think that uh, each byte of the output will depend on the full inputs. But in this work, oh, I cannot, uh, I can't uh, <laughs> move the, <laughs> I can't move the slide. <laughs> I. Yes, it's, oh, thanks. <laughs> so uh, in this work, we, we find some alternative representation of the AES key schedule. So for the free version of the AES schedule, 
And uh, those representation, this demonstrate that even after a large number of rounds of key schedule, the key schedule does not mix all the bytes. And this is quite surprising. Uh, we have two applications. The first one concerns the fact that when we iterate a non numbers of rounds of key schedule, uh, some short length cycles appear. And this is quite surprising. Uh, we apply this on mixed feed on the A. Uh, those are two uh, authenticative block ciphers. And here I will present our contribution on mixed feed. Uh, secondly, we also uh, demonstrate that uh, our new representation allows to uh, efficiently combine information from remote subkeys, uh, from distant subkeys, as for example, the first subkey and the last subkey. And this allows to improve the impossible differential on the square attack against the AES. So here I will present uh, the impossible differential uh, contribution. So let's start by describing our new representation of the AES key schedule. So uh, we start by looking at invariant subspaces. Uh, so an invariant subspace is a subspace A such that it exists an offset U that verifies F of A plus U equal A plus F of U. So it means that an affine subspace is sent to another affine subspace with the same linear parts. This can be generalized into subspace trails. So a subspace trail is a subspace A such that for all offset U, we have F of A plus U equal B plus F of U. And by looking uh, at the permutation corresponding to the uh, key schedule, uh, we found four families of subspace trails whose linear parts are E0 to E3. Uh, those subspace trails are cycles, so it means that E0 is sent to E1, E1 to E2, E2 to E3, and E3 is sent to E0. So uh, here, uh, our subspaces are images of each other. So if we, co uh, if we consider the permutation corresponding to four rounds of key schedule, then uh, the, we obtain some invariant subspaces. And we obtain even something stronger than invariant subspaces because here it's true for all the of offsets U. Uh, we also notice that uh, each uh, of the EI are of dimension four and they are all independent. And knowing that we are in a, a space of dimension 16, uh, the full space is just the direct sum of those four vector spaces. So in the following, we are going to do a basis change that corresponds to a basis of E0, E1, E2, and E3. So uh, to do that, we perform a linear transformation A, uh, which corresponds to changes of basis, and then the four subspaces with, will appear more clearly. So uh, we obtain this representation of one run of key schedule. Here, our four subspace trails appear more clearly, and we see four independent functions, each acting on four bytes. Uh, so uh, this representation is quite surprising because uh, we split uh, the computation into uh, four independent functions, each acting on four bytes. So here, the four functions are very similar. So we have three identical functions and one function that differ because there is a XOR with the round constant in addition. So looking at this figure, uh, we observe that uh, the key schedule does not mix all the bytes. Uh, so uh, that's our representation for one round of the key schedule. But if we want to represent several rounds, we will cancel the rotation of four bytes to the right by doing a rotation of four bytes to the left. And then we obtain this representation. So at the top, we have our master key. Then we apply our linear transformation A. And then each round of key schedule corresponds to one uh, line in this figure. And at the end, to obtain our sub key, we just apply the inverse uh, linear transformation, which is here denoted CR. So uh, for each round of key schedule, we apply in parallel three times uh, the function B, B and one time the function BI, which is similar to B. They are just uh, XOR with a run constant in addition. So here we show that uh, the computation of key schedule rounds can be split into uh, four independent computations, each acting on, on four bytes. So uh, this is our new representation of the, the key schedule. And now uh, let's move on to the first application. So the first application concerns the fact that when we iterate a non numbers of rounds of key schedule, we find uh, some uh, short length cycle. And we apply this to mixed feed. So uh, let's start by describing mixed feed. So uh, Mixfit was a second one candidate in the NIST lightweight uh, standardization process, but it wasn't selected as a finalist. Uh, it was submitted by Chakraborty and Nandi, and it's an AEAD algorithm. So it means that it's both used to authenticate and to uh, encrypt data. So uh, Mixfit works as follows. So first, uh, there is an initialization part that I do not represent here. So in the initialization part, uh, starting from a nonce on the master key, we compute an IV, uh, the initial vector on the key Z. And then uh, for each uh, block of message MI, we apply a feed function and an AES encryption. And at the end, we obtain our tag T. 
So uh, here, the fit function is just a linear and invertible function. And uh, the most important uh, thing about mixed fit is that all the AES are expected done to be done with different subkeys. So it means that the first AES is expected to be done with the key Z, the second one with the key P of Z, and et cetera, with P the permutation corresponding to 11 rounds of key schedule. So it means that in the first AES, we compute the subkey K0 to K10, then we will also compute the next subkey, which is K11, and K11 uh, will become the master key of the second AES. So if P is iterated, so in the following, we will study its cycle. Because if there is a cycle in the permutation P, uh, it means that uh, two AES will be done with the same uh, master key. And then uh, there will be some possible attacks, like a forgery attack that I will describe later. So uh, what is important is that uh, the, 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 the designers of mixed feed expect that all the AES are done with different subkeys. But if a subkey appears two times, then there will be some attacks. But in 2019, uh, Mustafa Kailara find 20 cycles out of 33 tests for the permutation P. And this is quite surprising for two facts. The first one is that all the cycles he found are of the same length, uh, which is 2 to the 33.7 approximately. And the second surprising fact is that uh, this length is much smaller than the expected length for a cycle uh, over 128 bit permutation because the uh, expected length is 2 to the 127 approximately. So in the following, uh, using our new representation of the key schedule, we will explain this observation. So uh, to do that, uh, we start by looking at uh, the permutation P, which corresponds to 11 rounds of key schedule in our new uh, representation. So uh, here we'll define F1, F2, F3, and F4 as the four function applied in, in uh, each on a four byte chunk. And then uh, we see that there is a left rotation of four uh, bytes uh, when we iterate two times. So if we iterate this four times, then the left rotation will be canceled and we obtain this representation. So here I represent four iteration of 11 rounds of key schedule in our new representation. And uh, if we denote phi one, phi two, phi three, and phi four, the four function uh, each applied on a four byte chunk, then we will be able to uh, study the cycle, the possible cycle length of the big permutation, so the permutation P tilde 4, uh, compared to the possible cycle lengths of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4. And what we observed is that the length of the small cycles, so the cycles of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4, divide the length of the big cycle. And conversely, the length of the big cycle is just the lowest common multiple of the length of the small cycles. But in general, the lowest common multiple of uh, four numbers are no reason to be really smaller than the product of those numbers. But here, the function phi i are not uh, are particular because they share the same cycle structure. So it means that if we have a cycle of length L for phi 1, then we will also have a cycle of length L for phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4. Uh, this is due to the fact that the function phi i are just a composition of the function f i, always in the same order, but with different starting points. And uh, if we take the lowest common multiple of L, 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 and L, it's just L. So here, our short length cycle appear. So uh, to compute the possible cycle lengths for uh, the permutation P tilde 4 on, P, P, on the, the permutation P, we just need to study the cycle of one of the uh, function, permutation phi i. So we choose to study phi 1, for example, and it's a 32-bit permutation, so it's easy to study. And we obtain that with probability 82%, uh, an element belongs to the largest cycles of uh, phi 1, which is of length L. Uh, and the same thing happened for phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4. So uh, with probability 82% power 4, so approximately 45%, uh, we obtain an element in the cycles of length L for p tilde 4, and an element in the cycles of length 4L if we go back to the permutation P. So uh, to sum up, here we obtain that 45% of the keys belong to a cycles of length L. Uh, and this explains the observation made on mixed feed by Mustafa Kailara that I presented previously. Uh, this also uh, allows to make a forgery attack against mixed feed. And uh, this contradicts uh, an assumption made in a security proof by the authors of mixed feed. So uh, this is the explanation. Uh, this is all for the explanation of short length cycle. But uh, now let's explain briefly the forgery attack. So uh, the goal of a forgery attack is to forge a valid tag T prime for a ciphertext C prime using a message, a ciphertext, and the type. And uh, to do that, Mustafa Kailara proposed to uh, assume that the key Z belongs to a cycle of length L. 
and to choose a message M made of M blocks with M bigger than L. Then uh, he applies a cut and pass strategy. So first, uh, he compute, uh, we need to compute the two pink arrows uh, using the fact that feed is a linear and invertible function. And then we will pass the two pink arrows and uh, compute a new ciphertext block, cipher block that is, is also authenticated by the same tag T. So uh, here we obtain a forgery attack that only requires a non plain text of length higher than 2 to the 37.7 bytes. It doesn't require any memory or time complexity, and it succeeds when the key belongs to a cycle of length L. And we have previously demonstrated that this happened with probability 45%. We have verified this uh, using the mixed feed reference and implementation, and we obtained 41 success out of 100 attempts. So it's quite coherent. So uh, this is all for the first application. So now for the second application, uh, we look at impossible different cell attack against the AES. So uh, uh, this is the impossible, attack, uh, impossible different cell attack against seven rounds of the AES. And this attack can be decomposed in two parts. First, uh, we will find some candidates uh, to the bytes marked with uh, G in the figure, so the bytes belong to K0 and K7. And then in a second step, we want to find the corresponding master keys. So uh, to do that, what was previously done is to start from the uh, 10 known bytes of K0 and then do an exhaustive search of the six missing bytes and uh, then filter according to the four bytes of uh, K7. So naively, what is what was done? So uh, is to guess six bytes and then filter using four bytes of K7. But using our new representation, we are able to filter uh, so, uh, according to two bytes uh, of, K7, uh, of K7 without guessing uh, the six missing bytes of uh, K0. And this uh, will uh, reduce the time complexity. So uh, in order to show you a little bit how it works, uh, here we re represent K0 and K7 in our new basis. So we put in black uh, all the non bytes and in gray all the unknown bytes. And uh, we want to filter according to one byte of K7. So here, uh, the easiest thing to do is to filter according to K12. And what we observed is that uh, to compute the value of K12 according to the uh, first sub key uh, K0, we just need to know the input of F1. So we just need to know 32 bits of information about K0. So this is quite surprising. And here we already know two bytes of K0. So we just need to guess two more bytes of K0, which are uh, K12 and K14. And then we are able to filter according to K12 uh, of K7. So here by guessing only two bytes of K0, we are able to filter according to one byte of K7. Then uh, after, after guessing two bytes uh, of K0, so the byte K12 and K14, we can see that uh, all the input of F3 is known. So uh, if all the input of F3 is known, then we are able to compute all the output of F3. And then um, we are able to filter according to a second byte of K7, because here uh, the byte in position six of K7 can be decomposed as uh, K14 XOR K6 XOR K14. And then uh, here we are able to filter according to a second byte of uh, K7 by just having guessing two bytes of K0. So here I detail for the two first bytes of K7, but then we are going to do the same for the two remaining bits, uh, bytes of K7. So uh, this is an interesting result that can be generalized. So uh, what we obtain is that uh, using our new representation, uh, a byte in the last column depends on only 32 bits of information of another subkey. So uh, for example, the master key. Uh, and the byte in the third or in the second column depends on only 64 bits of information. And the byte in the first column depends on uh, the world subkey, so 128 bits. So uh, this demonstrates uh, that even after a large number of rounds of key schedule, the key schedule does not mix all the bytes, and this is quite surprising. So uh, we apply this to the impossible differential attacks, and we slightly improve the data time on memory complexity. And uh, more recently, we also uh, apply this to uh, other attacks, but this was not uh, in the European paper, but it will be soon on ePrint. So we slightly improve the related key impossible differential attacks against uh, AES192, the impossible differential attacks, again, Rindal with a block size and a key size of 256 bits, and uh, the square attacks against A runs of uh, AES192. So uh, let's conclude. Uh, so the, in this work, we find some alternative representation of the key schedule. 
So uh, for the 128 bit version, we split into four chunks of four bytes. For the 192 uh, bit version, we split into two chunks of 12 bytes. And for the 256 bit version, we split into four chunks of eight bytes. So uh, we apply this on mixed feed on the A, and we explain an attack on mixed feed and find a new attack on A. Uh, in the boss case, they exploit the presence of short length cycles when iterating uh, non numbers of runs of key schedule. We also uh, improve the impossible differential and the square attacks against the AES by combining more efficiently the information from distant subkeys, as for example, the first and the last subkeys. And uh, all of this confirms that the key schedule should not be considered as a random permutation. So uh, thanks for your attention. And if you want more detail, you can read our paper. I have to share the microphone here a little bit. <laughs> uh, questions from the room, from remote? If you're remote, I think, I hope you can speak up in the room. So it occurred to me, my question here, um, what are the practical implications for the security of AES now? You had your slide yes. where it's, it's yes. a bit less and less and less. What is the practical implication on the lifetime of AES? For the moment, I think uh, the security of AES uh, is not compromised mm -hmm. because uh, our improvement is quite so small, but uh, perhaps some other attacks will appear one day or okay. and they will be- <laughs> Others will extend it. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but for the moment, uh, our improvement is quite slight, so. Okay, I have one other question. How did you come up with this idea? Is it some Heureka moment uh, where no, you we are? St uh, we start by studying mixed field. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to explain the observation by Kaila. Mm -hmm. And uh, to do that, we studied the key, the key schedule. Mm -hmm. And by looking at the representation of uh, one round of key schedule, we like uh, by drawing some uh, other representation of the key schedule, we find this representation. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Our starting point was mixed field. Good. Thank you. And congratulations <laughs> again. Thanks. Okay, I understand. Let's stop the sharing here. I understand that there is now a coffee break here, a nighttime break wherever you are on the world. Uh, the conference resumes here uh, in the room and in the virtual rooms at the next full hour uh, with public key 